The Democrats have a, a, a very good uh, democracy agenda, but it notably leaves out uh, the right to vote for who you want. The right to vote is absolutely critical, but it has to be accompanied by the vote, the right to vote for who you want, because if you're just voting for people who've been pre-selected by the money primary, it doesn't really do you any good. It's just kind of a, you know, it's a placeholder. It's a, it's a pretense. And I think it speaks volumes that the Democrats have son, somehow managed not to learn about ranked choice voting. Now they've learned about it in New York City where they've adopted it for their own primary, but they stop it when it comes to the general the general election in New York City because, you know, goodness knows, we'd hate for, for democracy to prevail uh, and real competition to take place, which is, you know, it's like, it's obvious, that's what we need. And they're all for ballot access, or shall we say voting access, except for other parties that compete. Yep. So yeah, there, there are a lot of specifics that we could be collaborating on with other political parties that are truly people powered. And time's a wasting, you know, I think we need to get down to this as quickly as possible. Agreed. Um, one of the things that that's come up recently is there seems to be a difference of opinion over strategy. And so those of us at RBN, we're trying to motivate people to try to change the strategy because of what we've seen happen with the squad, uh, because we've seen the money, we've seen how the Democratic Party pretty much kind of selects like who they want in, right? So the Progressive Caucus made it very clear they didn't want Nina Turner. So did the Congressional Black Caucus say they didn't want Nina Turner. So we've been telling people that we think we need to change the 80-20 rule. So we've been doing 80% electoral politics, maybe 20% direct action mutual aid. And we're asking people to switch that, to do 80% direct action and mutual aid and 20% electoral politics. And for some other reason, there's been kind of like this podcast tour of now we're called nihilists or, or nihilists. I forget that how they pronounce it. Because some people hear that and they hear that, oh, we just want to give up and not do anything. And it's not that we don't want to do anything. We just want to do a different strategy. And I think we want more people to be encouraged to vote independent and Green Party, like for third party candidates. And for whatever reason, like even within like this left independent media space, that is looked down upon. That's seen as like defeatism. And I, I don't know why that is. But I want to talk to you about strategy because this is how I look at it. If the Democratic Party is owned by Wall Street, same with the Republican Party, and we've seen what has happened to the progressive candidates that go into this party, they don't get to push the other corporate Democrats left, right? Like they're not in charge there. If that is the case, then how long are we supposed to continue this inside strategy game? before we get any types of tangibles, because I don't think even if Nina Turner would have won, that wouldn't have given us Medicare for all. You know, uh, all politics is local, you know, and, and I think your choices are local and it depends entirely on kind of what are the options on, on the table. I think it's nuts to put energy into political campaigns that haven't given you a really compelling reason to support them. And, you know, in my view, the real engine of social change are social movements, and in particular, building the capacity uh, for the general strike, you know, and, and all the things that go into that. And anybody you know, I, I strongly agree with kind of the Shama Sawant approach, which is that you have to be in the community working on the community stuff before you ask for anybody's vote. And I don't buy at all the image of the professional politician or people who grew up thinking, I want to be a politician or I want to be a senator or I want to be president. You know, to my mind, that's kind of a disqualification for, for actually serving in the office if there's an element of your kind of like professional, personal status and goals, you know, to me, my mind, that's, that's like a good sign of someone who's not really going to be uh, serving public needs. So um, I, you know, whether it's 
2080 or 1090 or 199 <laughs> or the other way around. I think it really depends on whether there's a compelling, you know, candidate for you to be, you know, to be supporting and that you uh, really feel in, com in complete community with. So it's not about supporting a politician or an election separate from your social movements. I think they really have to be you know, just joined at the hip. There's a question here. I, I think this is a good question. Thank you for this, Carl, for the super chat. How can the Green Party compete when the duopoly makes it so difficult? 133K signatures needed in Florida just to get on the ballot and can't debate them. Well, Jill, if I remember correctly, I think you were on the ballot in 48 states when you ran in 2016. Uh, it, it was approximately that number that included some where we were a write in, but you know, we were close to that number. It might have been 45 or so being, you know, uh, completely bona fide on the ballot. Um, and, you know, there are some that are extremely tough. I don't remember Florida offhand, to tell you the truth. Maybe somebody. Uh, who's in Florida can tell us whether we were on the ballot there or not. But yeah, there are some states that are absolutely prohibitive. There are some very good attorneys, and I want to give a shout out to the Center for Competitive Democracy and Oliver Hall, who is kind of leading the charge there. He's also our attorney in our fight with the Federal Election Commission. Um, you know, just the, the, the playing field is so tilted against... Uh, people power in every way imaginable. Yeah, it's really hard. And then media will try to lock you out. That's why, you know, I think it's really important to aim at a grassroots level, at the level of, you know, state rep or municipal offices where you don't even have to have ballot access for most, you know, you don't, you don't have to be a political party that has ballot access and you don't even have to run with a political party. Although I think it's important to be building a political party. Uh, even if it's not like a ballot line for a city or or town office, there are just lots of ways that um, that we can fight where the tables aren't quite so turned against us. And I think being networked, this is where that kind of broad coalition of progressive independent parties comes into play because it's not just to push a presidential candidate across the finish line. You know, long before we get there, we got to get people, you know, independent, uh, progressive candidates. And I mean independent, because there have been some progressives elected, again, inside of the democratic machine where they're going to get shut down. I think it's really important to get progressive independents, not only into uh, city council. And the Greens had a terrific, um, uh, city councilor in Minneapolis, uh, Cam Gordon, for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. He just lost a re-election, but I think he's going to come back at, at some level. So, you know, that, Shama Sawant, um, Greens have had occasional uh, state reps, and we have other uh, city councilors, not in such prominent cities. But, you know, these are the races we need to really excel at. And I think we need to collaborate to target uh, a lot of them so that we can begin to gain the momentum, begin to gain the database, begin to gain the staff. You know, uh, it's hard to run large campaigns if you're not really trained up in it as staff as well as as candidates, you know, but the staff are prohibited from working outside of the Democratic Party or they will basically lose their access to Democratic candidates. So, you know, the noose is there just tugging very tightly uh, in all dimensions of the system. So we have to build experience together from the ground up. And I think we can do that. Do you think that Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders has, has hinted at possibly running again? <laughs> um, I, I have my opinion on that, but do you think that Bernie Sanders should run again in 2024? I think he should consider running uh, as an independent, um, as a 
you know, as progressive and independent, maybe even running with Nina Turner, you know, or, or, or someone else, you know, I think Nina Turner should also, and I know she's been asked the question, I heard her um, asked on uh, Katie Helper, uh, and she declined to answer the question. I'm glad to say she didn't like knee jerk to say, oh, you know, I remain a loyal Democrat. She's going to be vilified for that. I mean, she's already been vilified because she appeared um, at an event with me at the DNC, you know, of the Democratic National Convention in 2016. We were both at an event sort of promoting people power. And because she was on the platform with me because I had asked her to consider running as a, a running mate um, for, you know, vice president as part of a team. And because she, you know, she didn't go screaming um, in opposition to that and never, uh, never tried to hide that fact. Um, yeah. You know, I, I have respect where, for where she's coming from. And She's paid a big price uh, not to have been a, you know, kind of a, a, a machine candidate and a Democratic Party robot. She's paid a huge price and she's been completely torn to shreds for it. Um, I respect her a lot. And um, I would love for her to, you know, be open to a conversation about running uh, as an independent. I hear you. Uh, there was a discussion with her uh, recently with Ryan Grimm on Rising. And one of the things that she mentioned was that she was told that she was not the right kind of Democrat. That's why the Congressional Black Caucus decided to endorse Chantel Brown over her. And so basically she can't be bought <laughs> like she can't like basically she's not corporate. So they don't consider that to be the right kind of the right kind of democrat and i, I want to get your opinion about the the caucuses because it seems like now when it comes to the progressive caucus when it comes to the congressional black caucus their endorsement means a lot and so i think about some of these other progressive candidates that are running if they do not get that endorsement come the general election you know is the same thing going to happen to them like it happened to nina turner and and i also want to add Right now, you have Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn choosing to endorse uh, Henry Quayler, who is anti-choice choice when it comes to abortion over Jessica Cisneros, who is the progressive candidate. And at the same time, they're telling people we have to codify Roe v. Wade, even though they had years to do this. I can go into a whole dialogue about that. They had plenty of time to do that. But there's just a lot of hypocrisy. And I, I feel like the Democratic Party has found a way to try to stop progressives from winning. I think when AOC and um, Ayanna Presley and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, that first wave that went through when they won, I feel like that wasn't really supposed to happen. And I don't think they really thought that AOC was going to be you know, Crowley and, and she did. And I feel like since then the party has like adjusted and they've figured out a way, let's figure out a way to stop them so that we don't get more of them in. And, you know, truth to tell, they've been doing this for a long time. You know, you can go back to uh, Dennis Kucinich, you know, who was kept off of the debate stage. This is, you know, going back 2016, maybe even before, you know, where he just, he was the wrong kind of Democrat, you know, George McGovern, who got the Democratic Party nomination, you know, he was the wrong kind of Democrat. And when he got the nomination, you know, that's when the the um, the DNC went in and basically commandeered the whole nomination process and created the superdelegates so that you wouldn't get the nomination of a truly people powered um, progressive candidate for the office ever again, you know. The party, I mean, you can go back to um, uh, FDR's final nomination in Chicago, where his running mate was going to be the very uh, progressive VP, I'm forgetting his name at the moment, um, but that was, you know, that was totally rigged and they actually shut off the nominating microphone and declared a fire emergency in order to evacuate the convention 
and prevent the nomination of the progressive vice president because it was, you know, it was understood that uh, FDR was, you know, was not long for this world. And instead of getting, you know, a really uh, inspired, um, uh, people-powered, progressive socialist, uh, mm -hmm. instead, you know, we got Harry Truman and the atom bomb, you know, and the Cold War. And history completely reversed the direction that it was going in at that time. So the Democrats will pull out all the stops. They always have. And, you know, it's just foolish to think that we're, you know, going to somehow figure our way around this. Um, this is just what they what they do. And the Democratic uh, Progressive Caucus and the Black Caucus, you know, this is, they're just continuing to exercise the Democratic Party playbook. So it's really important, I think, for us to just draw a line in the sand and start building something. Because if you just run a progressive campaign inside the Democratic Party and you get defeated, you know, or like, say, Paula Jean uh, Swearingen, you know, who mm -hmm. wrote, ran against Manchin in West Virginia, you know, she was just totally shut out. You know, she was a progressive pro-choice candidate, but the Democratic Party uh, machine made sure that an anti-choice candidate, who's not only anti-choice, he's really anti-everything related to the Democrats' progressive agenda, um, you know, and the machine does whatever it takes to ensure that the Democratic Party can do no more than just fundraise and fearmonger based on their agenda. But they ensure that they do not have the votes, no matter how many reps they have in, in uh, Congress or the Senate, they ensure that that's not the agenda that their candidates, you know, of the candidates that they're backing. So they create a, um, a kind of um, self-inflicted helplessness 